No more time. Oh, are God, we're live. We're live. Ah! We're live. What? what? Not going to sing or anything crazy? What? Oh, come on. <laughs> okay. All right. I guess he's gone. -ish. And Carol's talking to our producer, so. <laughs> oh, we got to talk about Frank. He's not listening. All right. Hi, everyone. This is Between the Rolls, our Murder Hobo Inc. attempt at a talk show. Uh, we'll get to, let's see. Yeah, let's do the usual. Um, you know, follow us on Twitch, follow us on Twitter. Take a look at our YouTube archives where all our previous episodes are. And you can sit and binge all the campaign episodes or all the one shots or all the Margu campaign or the Cacophony soap opera. Uh, all great stuff. You'll get it done twice as fast as if you were trying to watch a Critical Role campaign. <laughs> That's right, because unless it's a Kyle episode, it's only two hours long. A Kyle episode is a long Well, uh, I'm combining BTR and my episodes <laughs> together. Those are four. Divide by two. There are two hours each. <laughs> one plus something, and, and we're in base six, not base ten. Yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> all right of course there's the other thing if you uh if you want to buy any of our stuff we've got all sorts of great stuff in the store you buy t-shirts and sweatshirts and duvet covers and god knows what else uh, i it's been a you while buy a skateboard you buy that's right they have skateboard decks i know they have like notebooks i think or uh zippered bags all sorts of neat things I believe it's down there. I think that's what Frank always says. Uh, and then, uh, of course, if you want to talk to us in Discord, hey, you know, we've got a Discord. We'd love to talk to people. Uh, it's down there. Um, it's M. Hey, Carol, remember what I was talking to you uh, last time after the green room? What? Podcasting and, you know, saying things like down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Work. You know what? That's all. It's at the bottom. Yeah, but I also was about to say it's uh, it's was it M Hobo Inc. A, a tiny URL is the way you can like find all the stuff or just Google it. Um, of course, I want to thank our sponsors, uh, Odd Fish Games, maker makers of Adventure Sense. So if your games stink, you can just open up one of those and it won't anymore. At least um. your room smells great, unless you have the sewer version. Also. And you just uh, got a house full of cats? D&D &D with your cat. That's right. That's right. Yeah. They just D&D &D with your cat again. That, that is so, I think that is such an awesome concept, by the way. Uh, and then, of course, I believe that they have the uh, cookbook where you can, where you have, you roll things up. I don't know. I, I, one of these days, I'm going to look at that cookbook. Um, oh, it's worth it. And, yeah, I know Kyle owns it. Uh, and then our other sponsor pirate dog dice no they do not polish dog turds or whatever else kyle would like you to think no they make really cool dice and you know what they roll Pretty. well especially if they make them for one of your characters if you commission them for a character uh they roll really well for that character now if you roll for anybody else uh, they'll roll like shit but if you roll for your character that you made them for they'll roll really well at least that's why probably Taryn is still alive at this point. Har, har, har. So I think with that, with all that housekeeping business, uh, I think we will introduce the other cast members. Of course, if you have watched us before, you know who all these guys are. Although um, <clears throat> we'll start with Scott, who thankfully is here tonight. Uh, yeah. He's been kind of away, you know, doing things like what, hunting and... Yeah, uh, just hunting and work, man. Well, I bought some land, so I was I'm getting the land ready for hunting season. Is is more than anything else. So when I have free free weekends, then I'm going down there and uh, you know working on on you know installing septic systems and solar systems and basically I'm I've turned myself into a prepper, and uh, I'm um, you know just in case uh, just in case my fearless leader Donald J Trump is not elected again. I'm going to take to the high to the high hills. I'm going to grab all my guns. I'm going to take my kids and fuck you, Yankees. Oh, yeehaw! <laughs> oh, 
Well, I'm just kidding. Too. I'm like probably the exact opposite of that. So who are you anyways, other than apparently a prepper and a cult member? <laughs> yeah, He's no, a so prepper I, in two senses of the word. <laughs> no, um, yeah, my, uh, my Twitter handle is uh, DM Poobah. I'm a dungeon master and a player. I've uh, been at it for a pretty good amount of time. Um, I used to play quite regularly on this, but like I said, my weekends have been taken up. But um, but I still uh, try to get in on BTR when I can. Uh, and I run a few campaign games um, that I've also had to suspend due to my workload and such as that. But I'm going to try to get back into it a little bit more. Um, strangely enough, uh, after I have the cabin ready, um, then um, I'm going to have some more free time. So I'm looking forward to be able to rejoin the, the cast and crew here at Murder Havon Inc. We're looking forward to it. <laughs> We do miss you. I mean, I, you're always a real- I miss you guys too. I really do. I really do. I miss you guys quite much. I I totally enjoy playing in games with you or being uh, your victim when you GM. Uh, okay, next up. Hey, Kyle, how about you go next? Just saying, Scott, we miss you a whole bunch. I miss you this much. <laughs> <laughs> That looks familiar. Thank you. We need some maturity, but it's for mature audiences only. That we had a warning at the beginning. If you read it, great. If you didn't, well, so be it. Nobody will. Nobody pays attention. Pays attention. All right, Cal. Who are you? And what do you have to do with gaming and such? Oh, what do I have? I have absolutely. I'm. I'm just the genius behind the curtain, offering amazing <laughs> ideas. Watch out! There's a dick there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Do you have anything else you want to say, or is that it? He also. Uh, hi, I'm Kyle. I'm in the campaign. I played Dewey Docamel. I'm on most of the BTRs, except when they want to replace me with someone with more head hair and less facial hair, uh, uh, who comes up with silly things like spoons of sustenance. Like, uh, wow, somebody got bitter. <laughs> no, volunteered yeah. to not be. He's the one that volunteered to step down, saying he needed a break. Uh, who said that? Not, not this kid. I read the emails, you know, when you send it to the list instead of just to the TM. <laughs> that that was a genuine accident. <laughs> yeah, but, sure. Look, here I am filling a hole. Yep, 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 yep. No one responded to my comment to you. By the way, he said that he's here to fill holes, and I responded, you know, you really should send Frank your pri you know, love me messages privately, not to the list. Mm -mm. All right. I, I didn't because I thought it cut just a little too close. <laughs> David, it's your turn. Who are you? God, how can I follow this? <laughs> I could be thinking your life choices right now. Yeah, I really am. <laughs> I'm starting to think I need to find another show. <laughs> hey, I'm kidding. You love I'm, us. kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Really? No, really. I am kidding. I have. Come on, man. <laughs> I have way too much fun here. And speaking of fun, I am usually in the Thursday night camp, uh, not non campaign, uh, the cacophony episodes. Uh, that is a recurring soap opera. It usually revolves around two characters in particular. I'm usually playing one, Carrie's usually playing it the other. Um, fun <coughs> right there. You can catch me most time. Um, most of our um, shows here uh, for BTR and every once in a while I'll do a, um, a Saturday one shot so and every once in a while I'll come up with something clever to write about or something but anyway <laughs> that's me I'm David I'm Ooh. glad to be here oh god sorry about that um, let's see all right Ooh, so you. who are you miss host oh yeah I 
and introduce myself, which does happen at times when I'm hosting. Hi, I'm your host. I'm Carol. I am a commission mini painter, as well as also a longtime gamer and sometime GM, who really unfortunately doesn't have any time to be a GM as much as I would like to run these guys again. I had a blast when I did it. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I know, I know. I really do. Well, how about you? Have you gotten anything written yet, mister? No. no. Didn't have said anything, <laughs> David. <laughs> All right, so let's cut to it. All right, so let's get I've got to a it. notebook of ideas, if that counts, Carol. <laughs> yeah. All right, so David, since we'll get to the our usual first topic, we talk about the games that were played this week. So David, yours was first. Mm -hmm. It would be Cophony campaign soap opera whatever mini campaign because right. they bought arcs that end uh it was episode what the hell is it so 148 criminal acts uh go yes. ahead <laughs> a lot of criminal acts were to be held in that episode oh my god well we go uh, let's see uh the main characters they get sprung from from jail a uh, little help from their guild master and the brilliance of Mortimer J. Sneed. You know, oh. Professor on, on sabbatical in cacophony from the Grand Academy. They train That's heroes. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, so the episode opens with their, our heroes being sprung. Uh, they decide, uh, they uh, follow a few leads, uh, trying to figure out what happened to one of their cellmates, and that kind of takes them into a perilous turn of events. Uh, let's see. Uh, let, uh, Zadar's uh, familiar almost ends up in a cat fight in an apartment, <laughs> in an empty apartment. Um, That's right. Yes. So basically what we were happened, there was... Um, uh, the the woman Sandra O, oh, who was the protester that got locked, uh, who got uh, thrown in jail with us. Prior to to that, to her being taken away, she slipped Zadar uh, a vial of poison, and it was poison used to um, in an attempted murder of one of the council members. Anyway, so after everybody got released, she got released on, uh, from being bailed out by a local crime figure and uh it was somebody that uh that uh cammy and zadar were looking into they had a run-in with uh one of the associates uh he ended up getting killed caitlin ended up well daphne ended up wearing the evidence and got us thrown in jail so <laughs> So anyway, as we were exiting, we noticed that uh, one of the usual suspects that are usually in the, the, the racketeering that's going on in Cacophony sprung Sandra O. Oh, yes, like killing Eve. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we decided to find out what's going on. Uh, we try to... Uh, find where Sandro lives. We investigated her apartment. Again, like I said, I sent my familiar in to scope it out. Yeah, she had a cat. Anyway, <laughs> uh, with her missing, we decided to, to look at um, a place of business that is quite familiar, especially if you've seen the very first episode of Cacophony. Oh my God. We ended up at a restaurant called Alfredo's and that was the usual hangout where the trio of mobsters, Lucky Luciano, Pretty Boy Floyd, and God, what was the other one? Anyway. I don't know. Oh, man. Guido. That's yeah. Guido, yeah. <laughs> well, Guido's Zadar is a changeling, so in the get out of uh, trouble for one episode or whatever, he shifted into Jessica, as in Jessica Rabbit. Seduced one of the, 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 uh, the trio, obviously Pretty Boy. So, yeah, when they ended up uh, investigating this thing with Sandra L and ended up at the restaurant again from Alfredo's, it was closed. So they try to persuade their way in. Uh, they ended up uh, giving a rude, uh, you know, uh, you know, push out of the door by 
two of the thugs that work there. Uh, Zadar ends up sleeping one and choking out the other. And next thing you know, <laughs> lashing them in a Greco-Roman uh, position naked in the middle of the street. So. What the fuck? That's the way anyway, so <laughs> Zadar sh shifts back into Jessica, tries to get back into the restaurant, gets let back in. And it was a reunion between Jessica and her love, Pretty Boy Floyd. Things got ugly. People got killed. And we're not in jail. But there was a series uh, of, uh, of things that were brought to light. The big, uh, the big, I guess the BBG has been exposed. And we'll see where that goes next episode. So tune in Thursday should be pretty exciting yeah i mean, usually it is, like it. Um, usually oh, it is pretty exciting it's legendary it's pretty crazy oh my god you're choking people out again mm -hmm. good job good job at least i'm not getting choked out so <laughs> but yeah that'd be a different kind of story <laughs> all right so i don't know kyle uh yes that is my name do you want to take a start with the campaign and I'll interject or do you want me to do it? Because you never usually remember. I, I usually remember. I just say I don't remember. So <laughs> I don't have to do it and I can interject my own comments, which may be endearing, but mostly not. They're usually endearing. In a Either endearing or offensive. So, you know. Or incredibly <laughs> offensive. I was going to say something about you choking someone out on the streets, but... Yeah, I know, boy. I set myself up for that of... one. Anything goes on this in this podcast. I mean, most anything goes. Uh, there's there's a few areas that are still off limits, but... Oh, not... they're not off limits. I'll, I'll there's make... no limits. I've already <laughs> made that. I mean, I've, I've, seen, I've seen public nudity on this show, so... I don't really <laughs> we all have. <laughs> so. That's where you recognize that dick film earlier. <laughs> right. All right, Mike, do you want me to oh, start? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, well, I will at least give some behind-the-scenes information to start off. Uh, oh. uh, so several months ago in the campaign, oh, yeah. uh, uh, we have encountered one Lord Bushmill who has sought to uh, hound the party uh, uh, after... Uh, <laughs> believed rumors of us killing his son. Uh, do we document to clear our names? Uh, wanted to make sure and wrote the Lord Bushmill a letter entailing a good portion of the details, but mostly a one-sided story of what had been happening to Lord Bushmill about how Perpetua and Lucas skin people and cut off penises to wear around the neck. Uh, how they tried to steal from a silver merchant, but how it was okay because he was a lycanthrope who was in disguise as a silver merchant. <laughs> uh, uh, how the cleric had joined a religious cult that was intent on destroying all information. Uh, let me see if I get my notes here. The unpredictables. You know, you should put this letter, by the way, on Discord, and maybe we should put all the questions and answers on Discord, too, for funsies. Well, I wasn't getting there. Let's see. Uh, revealing that Perpetua was a changeling. Um, oh, and that we released evil upon the world. And that had finally come to bite us in the ass uh, <laughs> as we were locked away. <laughs> after the uh, uh, siege upon Yaddle. Uh, and from there, the party got to talk to each other a little bit. And some not yeah. talking too much. But uh, I think uh, more on us rather than on, that's not on Frank, that's on us. We're not no. talking, there are people not talking to other people for reasons, right, do we? Uh, no, no, we were going to, and then I was interrupted, so. Bull. Uh, anyway, uh, previous to this, jail session, our uh, uh, average looking okay quality uh, Dungeon Master Frank sent us a list of 20 questions that he wanted us all to answer. And uh, having received the answers, he thought to himself, well, 
this would be a good idea. Let's just make a show on this. That way I don't have to actually write something. And so we spent the entire time answering questions, throwing one another under the bus, unless, you know, we weren't into throwing each other under the bus and we only had nice things to say. I don't actually think you're quite right there, but it wasn't the whole episode for starters. <laughs> we had some exciting that happened too. We had some jail stuff happen. Uh, we had some interrogation rooms. Uh, we were, of course, absolved of any wrongdoing. Uh, I don't agree with that, but, you know, Dewey was released because he was uh, okay. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, uh, we found out some secret information on Dewey's backstory, and we watched Taryn's sister get beheaded the same way she beheaded a bunch of gnomes who were from the library, I believe, as well as their guards. I would have to clarify with that with Frank, but that's what I remember from way back when. You're, you're not wrong, but you are forgetting something. Uh, you did forget the fact that you went to go. Uh, there was there was another gnome in jail with us who freaking antagonized Rocky. you because he was from that other cult of uh, mm -hmm. Derogenous. Oh, oh, from the cult. The other cult is the religion that Dewey follows. So yeah. we don't want to throw on the C word for that. So, no, that's what I said, the cult, of, the, the derogynous cult. He's from that. Anyways, he antagonized you. Derogynous you, cult? He, that's what it's called. They're from the derogynous zone. So. Yep, yep, yep. I'm pretty sure. Oh, derogynous. I thought you said erogenous. Uh, yeah, well, I, I thought so, so too. <laughs> make that, to make that mistake. That's the cult I'm a part of. Uh -huh. Yes. So, first of all, I say. <laughs> That's obvious. First of all, I'm going to say. First of all, I'm going to say about the questions. <laughs> after hearing, you know, after seeing this, uh, first of all, it was very enlightening. I did not realize that Lucas would run or would cut off people's dicks and wear them. That was very. Really? <laughs> forgot that he did that. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> oh, Ernie doesn't oh, keep oh, notes. Wait, I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, secondly, there wasn't. I mean, there was some throwing of people under the bus, but it really actually was surprisingly not nearly as much as I thought it would be. No, I didn't know even unless uh, and I looked to the questions because Frank said them all, but mine, mine are, I'll send mine out because something happened to, to mine, to the group. But I looked at them all and there really wasn't a heck of a lot of throwing each other under the bus. There was a it was mostly the answers were truthful, except for I think in a couple of cases where people forgot stuff. Um, but for the most part, it wasn't that bad. It was they were still interesting. I thought the best part was when Chris was asked uh, about uh, when the bridge got blown up, and they were trying to figure out. You know, they're trying to pin it on Lucas or trying to pin it on somebody, and they asked him if he went to the other side of the river to rescue somebody. And I'm like thinking, there's no way I could spin that one either. And I'm pretty good at spinning questions, spinning the truth on questions. And I, and to see him sweat, that was pretty good. Uh, but yeah, but the, the questions were too bad. Um, but the thing you forgot is, so we got released. But I'll tell you right now, uh, Lord Bushmill does not agree with this. And we're supposed to have a meeting with him about planning of... Uh, you know, all the everything that's going on in the kingdom and us going to destroy evil, I assume, is part of it. But he's not convinced that we should be let go, or at least some party members shouldn't be let go, like the ones who killed his son. Me. Uh, so I don't do that. But but after, yeah, after we had questioned, we did get released pending that we're going to go back to this meeting. And we got, we're, we're staying at that same inn that we were hiding out in uh, 24 hours previous. And <clears throat> this is this I thought was pretty funny too. Everybody knows Lucas does not like to answer the door when people knock on it. So somebody mm -hmm. knocked on the door and claimed they were bringing us dinner. Now, oddly enough, Dewey was off looking at the dwarf who antagonized him because now he's dead and Dewey wanted his stuff to rifle through his stuff. And that's what you were doing at the time, but we're all up in the room and Lucas opens the door and there's a gnome out there wanting to hand over dinner, saying that there's dinner and instead he shanked him with a knife. So basically they came and found us in our place to try to kill us. 
or probably try to kill Dewey, but Dewey wasn't there. Uh, we easily dispatched him. Uh, and let's see. Um, after what the hell was uh, yeah after that yeah Taryn we get to watch my sister get executed um, after she basically sat there and said Taryn you, your family didn't do anything to help me blah 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 she basically hates her family because she was kidnapped as a kid and no one found her uh, so she so much drama great so drama applicable today with you know all the uh, <laughs> prostitution rings going on. What mm. happened to your sister? I don't know. That was a hundred years ago. She became a pirate. A long time to have things. <laughs> she became a pirate. And then then uh, I was so impressed by her talents, she started working for him as an admiral uh, admiral in his navy. Uh, I got that much, I think, from... She slept her way to the top. No, I don't think so. But... <laughs> Uh, Frank did an awesome job playing her, and uh, he gave a, he had her give a speech at the end, which was fantastic. Uh, and all this, uh, after all this, and finding out that probably my parents are dead, half my friends are dead in Fulton, Taryn is looking at the ocean thinking, I think at this point, maybe it's good to just jump in and be done with it. But that's well, not hey, good. At least one of your family relatives isn't alive and trying to kill you. Well, that is true. Oh, that was the other twist. We found out that, so Dewey has two father figures. One father figure we know is dead. And that's why he, actually there was not a lot of talking in the prison because Dewey is really mad at Taryn and Lucas right now because we were fucking with his grave uh, for reasons. Um, and the other father figure who I don't think you liked as well, he was not as nice and warm and sunny well, we he's found out he's the library in the church he, now. He's trying to kill you. Do we think maybe he killed your other father figure, Alvin Knackle? Don't know. It's interesting. No. So the final, so the final curtain closed. We're all so let's see. You and Manise are off getting breakfast while me and Lucas were watching this execution, and there are three ships coming in. We do not know what's on them, but probably nothing good. My sister basically on her, right there at her point of death, she basically said, I was coming to kill you all. You probably should let me go well, to kill you all first because it'll be more merciful that way. And the so, ships. So awesome. And that was where we left it. And just brilliant. And the ships coming in. Don't forget about the ships coming in. I said the three ships that were coming in. Oh, you did? Okay, I just forgot. Yes, I did, like two seconds ago. Three ships coming in after she said that, and I'm going, I don't, I was supposed to be back in Fulton. Um, <clears throat> but hey, we'll see what happens. I think it's it's going to be interesting, and if we live, we'll have to go to this meeting and 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 see where it goes from there. And it's it's crazy, it's great, and boy, he's heaping the trouble on, and I freaking love every second of it. And I said, I loved his speech. I loved loved all of it. And the other two guys had a great time, too. So, all right. So, real quickly, David, give a little tiny bit about the Margu campaign. Okay, for the sake of brevity, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sunday, something happened. Now, uh, our Sunday campaign is... Uh, is a group of um, players, uh, three generations, three generations of Franks, and uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a lot, a lot of fun. Um, our previous episode, uh, or this past episode, is uh, a little reminiscent of a very famous movie. You might have heard of it, Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> Uh, there's some uh, hilarity that ensued. Uh, let's see, there was a dragon, uh, dragon poop, a tsunami. Are you sure it's a tsunami or concussions a from <laughs> from lightning strikes? Tsunami, just a hurricane on the other side of the and world? this gem encrusted boulder that's rolling and smashing things in town. So check it out in our archives it, it it is really funny i was i was watching and listening the episode unfortunately i kept getting interrupted but i'm going back and rewatching it so it's worth it i love that campaign so you check know it out. I, i'm gonna say some one more thing yeah watch all of our things uh go back and watch the campaign too and if 
Yeah, it said, and I know I'm one of the players, but maybe I should leave it to David. How was it? You watched it. You, it you was you- riveting. No, <laughs> yeah. no, seriously, it was good. It was a great culmination of things that have, uh, yeah, <clears throat> just been building up all season. So anyway, yeah, it was. So, yeah, go to our archives and watch all and watch all the cacophony episodes too, because they're fantastic. Uh, all these are very entertaining and a lot of fun. He said, if you're not watching watch it it's it's it really is that good um all right let's get to the actual uh topic the topic of <laughs> finally which is bad scenarios which is scenarios that players oftentimes can find themselves in uh where they can get stuck and have a hard time getting out of um causing and which can cause a lot of frustration and such uh, with the players and maybe even with the gm too um, you know, I'm going to go around the table here or whatever, around the, the, the Zoom thing. And I'll ask you to give me, give me an example of what you think is a bad scenario. You could take one off the list or make up your own. And um, you know what? Maybe we'll do, we'll combine both parts in this, um, which means I'll probably have to vamp at the end. But, uh, or find more based on what you say, because it's not a lot on this list. So I'm not really sad that we went a little long on the uh gaming parts but uh pick one and then say is it first of all say why you think it's why it's bad and such and then how would you fix it so let's start with so you david or do you want me to skip you to someone else kyle's been uh (laughs) no scott scott has been silent uh this whole time he has not I defer to Scott first. He looks quite Scott comes up with the best insights that no one else has. So I almost like to do him last, but you got a point there. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah. Pick, pick something that you think is a bad, you know, almost unwinnable scenario or whatever. Okay, a bad can. start. A bad start to a new campaign. That That is something that I think whenever you have a brand new set of players, just sit down for the first time. And for whatever reason, it just doesn't click. And I'm not talking about players not clicking together because that sometimes works itself out during the course of a campaign. I'm just talking, they all sit down and for whatever reason, either the players weren't ready uh, or the more than likely the DM isn't ready. And they just don't follow the plot hooks. There's just, there's some people that want to murder hobo. There's some people that want to role play. There's some people that are want to min max their characters. It's a bad mix of characters. It's a bad mix of a, of a start of a campaign and it just doesn't click. That I think is probably the, the hardest thing for, for a group of players and a DM to try to get over in a bad situation in a bad scenario is when you're starting off and it starts off like shit. How do you fix it? That's a much more nuanced question. <laughs> and it's really, really hard. It, honestly, it's hard. Um, it's really, really hard when things don't click off and the players are not engaged that normally that has a tendency on, I don't want to say normally, but it can send the DM scramble. And if they're not, if the DM, if that person is not prepared enough or doesn't have enough experience or is just, is just um, not, not for whatever reason, just is overwhelmed. Uh, sometimes it crashes and burns and it can't be fixed. Now the way to fix it, the, the, there is a path to fix and it's normally is to let it play out for a while. And if, if it goes along, then you just have to kind of manage the train wreck and then find a point as a DM, what you need to do is you need to find a point to corral the players back into, back into a state. If it requires more back into an acceptable adventuring state, what I mean by this is something needs to happen. You need to have some type of MacGuffin, some type of, of event that puts all the characters in jail, that puts them in front of an NPC that, that, that corrects them, that, uh, that there's some overt hints. There has to be some type of change agent that comes in and can set things correct. 
some type of construction needs to come from the DM at that point to make the best efforts to try to set things correct. That's on the scenario side. If it's the players, and if there's one player that's just being disruptive and is just being a shit, well, then the rest of the players need to tell them to pack up and GTFO. That, that it's hard to do, but sometimes it, it's, it's necessary to do. So if it's on the DM side, um, then the DM needs to, needs to come better prepared next time. If it's because they didn't follow the plot hooks and they're just lost wandering around, then you need to bring in some type of NPC MacGuffin type of situation to correct the situation. And if it's uh, the, if it's a player or if it's a group of players that are just being disruptive, then they have to leave. So that's, that's, that's how you fix it. But my, my nightmare scenario is you start off a campaign that you prepped all this time and for some whatever reason, players just aren't getting it. It just doesn't click. It just doesn't go. Oh, that would suck. That would, that would absolutely suck. And you're right. That'd be really hard. Things not clicking would be really hard to deal with. I mean, I like the idea of finding something uh, to bring them together and maybe try to make it click. But I mean, if it, if it really doesn't, then yeah, maybe there is no fix for it. I don't want to, I don't want to ever say never. I think there's always a way to try to work something out. I mean, I do, I do get to be saying there are definitely players that you do need to remove from the table because they're, they are just, yeah, too disruptive to your game. And I mean, I've, and I've, you know, I've come across those too. We, we, Sadly, we've had to have, ask players leave our games that we've had here. I mean, and that's but, hard, right? I, honestly, I, mean, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but that's hard because oh. we, we we have to be we have to be honest with ourselves that if we're if we're talking about a community that that likes playing role playing games, then then we also have to understand that there's going to be a a a fairly decent chance, and I don't mean to besmirch anyone in the role-playing game community at all, but, but you know, RP, you know, Dungeons and Dragons players and RPG players and tabletop role-playing gamers, we're all a bunch of nerds. And, and, you know, sometimes that means not all of us have great social skills. You know, some, that, that sometimes comes with it. But, you know, a lot of it is my heart goes out to them and, and every one of them, I consider them's my people, you know. And, and so when I see someone struggling with social cues, when I see someone struggling to fit in, when I see someone, you know, I, my, my, my heart goes out to them. And I, and I want to try to help them adapt and, and I want to try to help them be, be, you know, using this game to be that, that type of, of of avenue for them to to be more socially accepted to 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 understand how to get along with people more to to be that avenue or to be that vent for them to be able to uh to be able to do what role-playing games do so well that is let a group of people come together and tell a story so so it's it's hard to actually kick someone out that's that's a tough tough thing to do it really is as i said it we've had to do it here and no, it's never fun and we never want to do it. And it, and we usually let things go on long enough that it just finally enough is enough. Um, yeah. You know, and I mean, and sometimes too, you know, you just have, have people with different play styles that completely clash as well. True. Yeah. True. You're right. You some people, they're people with me and Kyle, we love to role play, you know, while others really like to munchkin their characters and become super powerhouses <laughs> and can do everything. And that's, you know, that's not, that tends to clash with me because I believe that everybody needs to have a role in the group. Um, it shouldn't just be one person doing everything, but that's my opinion. You know, that's, that's not, you know, everybody's opinion. So clashes can happen too. Um, anything else? No, that, that, that's my two cents on one type of bad scenario. I have comments on everything on your bit there, but, but I think we need to let other people talk. Yeah, no, I mean, and as I said, I always like to let people pick stuff off the list or said, or in your case, you kind of did your own thing. So that was, that was really cool. I, and I like your answer. All right. So uh, we're trying to find Kyle, you can go next. All right. All right. So just to go off, let's define bad scenarios too, because 
That's important. Scott, you actually went the same direction I went when I saw bad scenarios. I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, bad scenarios like that. And then I saw the list and I'm like, well, no, these aren't necessarily bad scenarios. This is <laughs> what I said. Yeah. <laughs> this is bad so, situations. <laughs> I'm going to say, let's uh, uh, let's define it a little bit. We have the bad scenarios out of game, which is very much what Scott was talking about. Yep. We have bad scenarios in game, and this is where the party and the players stop, and they just don't know what to do. Mm. Um, which can be the unbeatable boss, or very, very often puzzles or doors <laughs> for some parties, but they usually figure out. Uh, uh, and then you have tough scenarios, is what I'm going to call it, because it's not necessarily bad. Uh, I mean, it's bad, but the players can get out of it if they think about it. And more often than not, they have the solutions right at their fingertips, whether um, they're lost in a swamp, a desert, a tundra, um, tundra. in outer space. You know, they, <laughs> yeah. have, they have ways to figure it out. Lehman's Tiny Hut, Goodberry, uh, um, Fireball, if you're in the tundra. Always gets people warm. <laughs> <laughs> but how does uh, that get them lost? Lost? Bah. Ah. It's like a giant flare about 30 feet in uh, 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 diameter. <laughs> <laughs> My so it solves two things with one stone. So um, talking about tough scenarios um, and how you fix them. Um, uh, actually, I will go ahead I will give you an antidote. This was the second campaign I was playing. Uh, uh, Frank uh, was my introduction to D&D back when Frank was especially Frankie. Uh, uh, lots of D12s were rolled back then. <laughs> uh, so I went over to Roll20 to find uh, 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 something a little bit more 5th edition. And also because I was bored and I had children at home. So I joined a game full of Australians. Um, that's a terrible idea, unless you want to wake up at 2 o'clock every morning to play when well, they're yeah, off of work. <laughs> uh, uh, and we ended up playing uh, Storm King's Thunder. Spoilers are coming, although they weren't necessarily according to the book. Um, we had a teenage Aussie who was running the show and a very creative kid, and I have to say... He is uh, um, iconic in how I look at D&D &D now, although I don't talk to him anymore because I'm an almost 30-year-old man. I shouldn't talk to teenagers. Especially. Might not be appropriate. <laughs> Might not be appropriate. <laughs> they can drink at a young age. It's fun. Wait a minute. <laughs> but one of the things that happens is after you finish the starting area, you are encountered by a cloud giant in a tower, a wizard's tower, who lets you get on and you hat. start to fly away. Huh? Has a big hat. Big wizard hat. Huge hat. It's almost as big as the wizard. Right. Wait, okay. One of the things that happens is that you encounter a bunch of air cultists who try and convince the cloud giant to join them. Uh, uh, what this uh, kid had done was he'd taken the scenario and changed it. Uh, the giant... Uh, took the bag they're offering, went upstairs, and then the tower began to rise as whatever the cloud giant had been given corrupted him, and he decided that we're going up into outer space with this thing. And so suddenly we were in a flying tower, floating up thin oxygen, fighting off cultists, until eventually we knocked out the cloud giant at which point the wizard tower started to fall and fall and fall from a very great height and would kill us all. And so uh, we as the party, this is how you fix those tough solutions, came up with an idea. I played a giant at the time, barbarian, I think, or paladin, one or the other. And some of the stuff we had discovered around the room, uh, um, which I think the kid may have even put in there was uh, slippers of Featherfall. 
And being a giant, I was the only one capable of wearing it. And I threw off all of my plate mail and everything that was heavy, grabbed the party members, put on these slippers, and then walked off the tower and hoped that... They lasted long enough. They lasted long enough. They did not. <laughs> <laughs> was it that old scenario where, like, an elevator's plummeting? You'll be fine if you just jump at the last moment. <laughs> It was very much like that. (laughs) Luckily, it gave out. We were over a lake, and because we weren't wearing that heavy armor that uh, I had taken off and I had asked everyone to take off, that tough, dire situation where the entire party was about to die uh, ended up being solved over creativity and some of the items that we had around us and had access to. So, you know, when the party is in that tundra, in the desert, in a swamp, um, a lot of those are situations that I like to put the party in. And I think that's because I had a great experience in a tough situation that seemed unsolvable. Uh, but I can still tell that story today and people can be like, yeah, that's, that's not a bad idea. And so that's how you solve tough scenarios. Uh, that's pretty much all I have to say. I hope the antidote came through, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, no, actually, I was going to say, now, what if you put your PCs in a situation that they they can't get out of? What so, would you as a GM do to try to help? Give me a scenario. Oh, Lord. <laughs> um, I don't know. I can, I'm not good at coming up with this stuff on the fly. Um, All right, here's what I would say. Let's say... Characters and curse of Strahd decide to start shit with Strahd at the very start when they're first level. That is the unbeatable boss, and I'm going to uh, let David talk about was, that one. I did that! <laughs> I remember. I remember. That's a segue. Do not talk back to Strahd. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you solve that situation. All right, guys. That's been Murder Hobo. <laughs> yeah, that, I was a bard. Off and getting pissy. That's what he wrote on Twitch. What's that? He said he wrote lost in a swamp and getting pissy. (laughs) No one got pissy, I think. When have we been lost in a swamp? I mean, Uh, the swamp kingdom. Now, I could see how a a party could get lost, totally get lost in a swamp or wherever, because a lot of times when you're you're trekking through that, you have to make survival checks, and all you have to do is take just a really bad string of dice rolls. That's actually a pretty good point. What would you do as a as a DM? Your PCs are trekking through a swamp, but they can't roll a survival check to save their lives, and they are now hopelessly lost. What would you do? They just die sometimes. They really sometimes, sometimes you just don't use the die. If you want them to succeed, don't use the die. But if you're wanting something to interesting happen, that's where you use the die. And if they fail that roll and they get lost in the swamp. Uh, I mean, there is such a way as PCs failing forward. Now, I hope it's not a nat one. A nat one's going to get you an encounter with a black dragon in the middle of a swamp, I feel like. Right. Level one? <laughs> yeah. Why not? But in that scenario, you've now encountered an intelligent being who can fly. That's true. And the party can find themselves a way out of that situation. They just have to think about it. Yep. And And as a DM, it is your job to imply that other avenues other than force uh, will uh, allow them to get through. Starting with the black dragon talking. Or, I mean, even if the party starts the attack first, if the dragon loses half its hit points, maybe it surrenders and begs uh, uh, for its life or something like that. At which point the party has a way to fly out of a swamp or at the very least get directions out. That's a good point. That's mm-hmm. that's a good answer too, by the way. Yeah, um, it's on in those situations, it's the DM know what's going on, what can happen, what they can encounter, what the party needs to continue going. Um, and if the party has trouble and runs into a wall, 
that's where maybe at that point you introduce an NPC. But again, because you know the area where you're at, if they're lost in a tundra, they encounter a, um, a white dragon or a Remoraz, which when they defeat the youngling, they can use the body to at least keep warm for the night. That's about to happen. And that that worked good, actually. That's a good, that's a cool idea. Yeah, and I thought cool they idea. smelled bad on the outside. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Okay. Any anything else you'd like to say, or gonna go to David? Well, uh, just know your scenarios, um, uh, and then with the next one, which maybe David will counter. I've I kind of implied that he would, but. <laughs> I don't know if you will or not. Uh, 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 sometimes your players will hit a wall. Damn it, go! I'm yeah, you that's where there, there's... In playwriting, there's this little thing. It's a little mechanic called Deus Ex Machina. Deus Ex Ghost Machina. in the Machine. And it's exactly what Kyle just discussed. It's just like, ooh. One of the other things is... I mean, that's where Kyle Brunt mentioned bringing in an NPC. And, like, say, for example, your players are lost in the swamp. Well, they're failing their survival checks. They're failing their nature checks. You know, they just, they just can't get out. So uh, I had this discussion uh, with another DM prior to the show, and one of the things that they said, well, why don't you have it? They were being tracked the whole time that there was a ranger in the swamp. Notice that their foot footprints are just going round and round in circles and stuff like that. Encounters them. If they don't, if they, if they don't try to kill the ranger or the ranger ends up killing them, it go either way. But, you know, offer to lend them a hand to lead them, you know, to a path that would take them out of the swamp or at least on to the next objective. So... But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's some, sometimes it, the DM has to intervene, you know? I mean, you know, that's a call that the DM has to make. And a good DM is going to see, you know, when it, you know, when's enough's enough, you know? So, I mean. Because I'll say right now, if you don't detect when enough is enough, your players are going to get very frustrated and it's just going to be, it's not going to be a good session. They're not going to be. Be happy. Drag them through. You know, um, I'm sorry, David. What else? I don't know. Do you have anything else? Okay. Uh, we moved on to you know, uh, you know, things the DM can can put into the game to kind of help move the game forward. But this is just a, a little story about how I got introduced to uh, 5e. I started at a play session at a comic book store and a friend of mine was the DM. Well, my friend, he's one of these old school, I mean, literally he started playing, you know, when the inception of DM basically, uh, you know, D and D. So hey, Frank, it's okay. And yeah, it is Frank. <laughs> no, <laughs> anyway, it's Scott. Really, he, He's seen it goes, you know, he's an older player. I mean, the rules just kind of, you know, uh, but one of the things about him that I, I noticed is that he didn't have the opportunity to DM a lot, you know, either play or DM. But, you know, here he is leading me and a group of kids in a game and he just showed up with nothing. I mean, no, no outline, no story. You, know, you just say, OK, we're in the Underdark. And he, I mean, I could see him literally thinking of things to say and just struggling. And, you know, it's just, he didn't know when to say enough, enough's enough. It wasn't until that his work schedule started intervening that somebody else had to take over. And unfortunately, that was me. But, you know, uh oh, we lost Kyle. Anyway. Lost Kyle. Sorry. Oh, sorry, 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 Frank. <laughs> anyway, my point point being is that, you know, as a DM, it, it is your job, if you want to carry, keep this game interesting and carry it forward, that you have to be prepared. And you got to be prepared for things that are, you know, unforeseen. You know, you've, you've right got to be... So. 
<laughs> like this. Like like some losing somebody. But anyway, the point that I'm trying to be uh, trying to make is is that. Uh, yeah, damn it, Kyle, you threw me <laughs> off, man. All of it. He's just like I was listening the whole time. I just turned off my camera. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's just you know you got to be prepared, and you as a DM, and you've you've got to understand. You've got to have a point A and point B, and a way to take your players there. And if they're getting lost in between, you got to be prepared to intervene. You know, so that's the point I'm trying to make, I guess. Mm. And I'll 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 piggyback on that one second because I'm I'm gonna have one point of slight pushback uh, as to what has been said so far, but it's not really an argument. It's just it's like I said, it's a slight little pushback in that. But I'll start off by agreeing with uh, David. DM has to be prepared. I mean that is that is what the DM's job is to do is to prepare the world and the environment and the scenarios and everything that, that, that the players are going to inhabit. That, that is a DM's job. And like I said, it's an exercise in, in collective storytelling. But one thing that separates D&D from, from Hollywood is that not all, all, not all stories end well. And some players die. And, mm. and sometimes it's players missing a series of survival checks in a hostile environment, a desert, a swamp, um, it may not necessarily be that, that they run into a black dragon in a swamp or they run into a, uh, you know, a blue dragon in a, uh, in a desert. They could starve. They could, they could die of thirst. They, there, are, there are environmental concerns that happen. One thing that I always like, for instance, and I, and I like this, 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 latest, this latest, uh, um, um, adventure that, you know, came out from, um, um, you know, what Rim of the Frost Mating or Rhyme, I guess, yeah, Rim of the Frost Mating. Yeah, it, 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 is it Rim or yeah, Rhyme? It, it, I thought it, it was Rhyme. I think it's Rhyme. Okay, it could be Rhyme, whatever. Whatever. Um, Whatever it is, but it's it's in a hostile environment. It's it's up in the, it's up in Icewind Dale, you know, north of the north of the spine of the world, and people freeze to death up there. So I mean, th there also needs to be an understanding that bad things happen, and it's the DM's job to understand when there's frustration due to. You know, it's a bad scenario. I haven't prepped that well, something like that. But sometimes players roll a one on a survival check to find game and there's nothing to eat. And that happens four or five times. You know, it, it maybe once or twice you can you can give them a deus ex machina and give them a ranger, give them someone, give them something like that. But if it happens too many times, then you run... You, you, you run the possibility of removing the element of danger from a game. And that has its own set of problems. I remember once when I was DMing the game and the players all got into a super high level and they were bored. N nothing was challenging anymore. The element of danger had been removed. So they, they, they thought they were basically invincible. And I'm not talking about the mechanics of how I tried to balance something. I'm talking when the players get to the point where they think that they're invincible, nothing bad can happen to them, and it's just boring for them. So there always needs to be that 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 hint, that 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 element of danger that they could die. And and so while I think that there needs to be um, the ability that sometimes when, especially young players um, or players that are just starting out playing. Uh, young campaign starting things out um, you know they don't need to first level character first hit first time in combat first hit the 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 orc rolls a 20 double damage and it's you know then they roll max damage and first hit first thing before they ever get to roll the dice they're dead and that's probably something the DM needs to intervene somehow because <laughs> that kid may or that person may never come back and play again. But there, there always seems to be a preservation of the sense of danger. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure how to do that. 
all the time, but um, but I know you can't always give the players an out. Sometimes, sometimes they need to die, but that's well, that's me as a DM. Sorry. No, 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 no it's no. right. Wait, 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 wait. Hey, uh, because you made a comment on something I said. <laughs> that is very much true, and I agree with what he said entirely. I mean, uh, partially, I like the idea of giving the players a way out, but if they just continually refuse to uh, uh, refuse to take it, they don't try to talk to that black dragon, or the black dragon offers to surrender, and they still go at it. Or between the first hit and the middle hit, where something happens, a player dies. A player dies. Uh, and my thought is um, with that. If you have a ranger in a swamp, maybe it's still not his favorite terrain, but he's still good enough to get some food. Mm. I feel like it should be, well, yeah, no, you're a hunter. You know how to hunt. This is a wooded area. It's not something you're used to, and you're not going to find every single thing that normally. But that skinny squirrel that runs through a tree, that happens in the forest too. So you know how to get it, and you're going to get it. But the party is going to starve unless you decide to maybe even eat this entire squirrel yourself by yourself. And at that point, I want to give players mm. options, character-driven decisions that are hard. Because this is a tough scenario and you're going to make tough choices. Uh, uh, which is why you should really eat the, uh, the fighter or the barbarian when you're in the tundra. <laughs> Alternate of Donner. All right. No, oh, I'm sorry. Did I? <laughs> I actually have something to comment on this whole thing. Okay. Oh. Now, oh. there's this, to me, there's a difference between, you know, missing rules on like things like, you know, uh, finding game and stuff, than being wandering around aimlessly in the, t in the tundra without, to me, to me, wandering around aimlessly is boring. All right, that to me is where it gets frustrating and boring. If I'm missing roles and finding game, that's part of the game. I mean, then that actually starts getting exciting. You know, if we start, you know, getting closer to closer to starvation. To me, that's exciting. Um, that's not boring. But, you know, not being able to find my way out after freaking playing this game for, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm at a table for like four hours and we're doing nothing but wandering yeah. around, that's boring and that's frustrating. And that to me is when, as a GM, you need to take, you need to try to do something else. That <laughs> yeah, that's if you're playing for four hours and there's nothing to do, and you're making your right. basic survival checks and you're eating, and you're just kind of wandering around, and and the DM is looking at you like, what are you going to do? And they're like, well, we're moving in this direction. And it's like you can't. Oh, no, that's not what I meant. I meant if you just keep getting lost. Yeah. You're just seriously getting lost. Yeah. You know? And you know, it's only so like random encounters are, are, are great, but there's only so many, you know, before I, there's only so many I want to deal with before I want to get back on the story. Um, oftentimes I'm not, I'm not crazy about random encounters. I do like them, but at times, but sometimes I really just want to get to the story. That's a, that's a player thing. But I think that's the difference. I think, I think that's, that's the difference between, you know, you, it's so sad. The starvation thing that actually is kind of exciting, and that to me is a tough scenario. But the bad dice rolls going, to, you know, going on too long, and we've all had our springs of bad dice rolls. Eventually, it just gets. It really does get frustrating. Plus, also you're rolling, you know, a number of really bad right. dice rolls in a row, and that there is that is really frustrating. As somebody who tends to do that quite a bit. Um, <laughs> I will uh, interject not, right now. Carol's the one who's making this go over time, but I'll add another thing. Actually, no, when because I, asked, you know, <laughs> I haven't even like had time to do much talking on the subject. So that's why you're the moderator. That's why I don't <laughs> like doing this. Shut the f up, man! Of... No, I'll never do that. Fine. Um, Hurry up. Um, <laughs> on that point, Carol, you know it's. Your DM, you know the area, and you also have to know when the environment is an encounter. And like all good encounters, six seconds should take about three hours. No, 
an hour. <laughs> uh, and you have to realize when it's over. And I mean, at that point, if you're in a blizzard in the tundra, let's go with that. That blizzard is an encounter. Your players are going to have to survive that blizzard. You can kind of move the blizzard along a lot faster than you would say a combat, um, but you are focusing on the blizzard. And when the blizzard is over, you need to say, okay, Ranger, you're here. You have a survival of 14, even though you're better suited to caves, but like caves, the tundra is similar in that food is scarce. You're going to be able to lead these people out of here. Let's just make a quick dice roll to see whether that's really quickly, or if you're going to be lucky about it, or if uh, maybe the halfling is not making it through the snow half as well as he could, and someone loses a toe or something like that. At which point, time jumps and understanding, yeah, understanding how time works. You know, combat gets expanded; everything else kind of does shrink down. Gets compressed. That's right. But it's, you know, is it that dungeon crawl 10-minute compression, 10-minute rounds? Or is it that exploration out in the wild, an hour is around, and how long is this going to last? And when the encounter is over, how quickly can your party get out of that situation? Yeah. And not necessarily asking for dice rolls, because... Right. Now, if the ranger says, yeah, well, I'm going to re- uh, lead these people around in the circle... All right, your ranger killed you. You're dead. <laughs> you made right. all decisions. All right. You and make sure as the DM, you explain the situation well enough that they can get themselves out of. And if they still don't get themselves out of it, kill them. Murder them. All right, are you done, Kyle? No! I have the last fucking word here. All right, so Always. before we go to final thoughts, I'm going to add one more thing to this. Because we're going to thing. Don't worry. Oh, be- shit. <laughs> no, uh, no, one- no. <sighs> you know, <laughs> talking over me, you know. I'm just kidding. Grab your pants, cause we're going long. You know what? We're going <laughs> long. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> no, uh, what I was going to say is this. I think also as a GM, one thing that you really need in situations like this is flexibility. You need to allow your players uh, you need to allow your players to uh, creatively solve problems. You know, if they come up with something that's creative and doesn't necessarily fall within the rules, allow it. Absolutely allow it if it gets them out of the situation. You know, don't also don't railroad your characters. That's a good, <laughs> like that's a good rule of cool, right there. Yeah, yeah. The rule of cool. I, this I is absolutely. Where the rule of cool comes in. And, and anybody who's been watching me knows I really like outside the box thinking. I like creative thinking and creative solutions. So, you know, I'm always open to that unless it really takes the just shut up, Frank. He's writing things. Uh, <laughs> he's making fun of me making jokes again because everyone knows Taryn can't tell jokes. No. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, my face, <laughs> shut up, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> You're not helping. They said they're writing shit uh, on the thing, just so it's everybody knows, because nobody else can see it but us. Um, it's fun watching Carol have a meltdown. <laughs> it's like uh, 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 so I, I I can't see it. So that's basically my thing: is be is a DM be flexible to their ideas. Uh, it's the rule of cool, absolutely in this case. Um, all right, so let's go around and do some final thoughts. Uh, let's see, I'll start with Kyle. Do you have a final thought? I have several final thoughts that this went long. This, well, That's entirely know. my own thought. No. Uh, <laughs> understand whether you're in a bad situation, a tough situation, and whether that's a in-game situation or an out-of-game situation. As uh, 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 Scott said earlier, you know, identifying that and uh, identifying the problem with your players and necessarily getting rid of it, you know, helps. Tough situations, just know your game, know when to kill your players if they have to, and making sure they know and that they have the possibility 
And finally, with the uh, in-game bad scenario where a puzzle or an unbeatable boss and they just continue to butt their heads against it, knowing when that's happening and, but, huh? and you need the rule of cool to help out. Uh, go. Go ahead. All right, David, next. Uh, <clears throat> when to walk away. Go away. No when to run. Yeah, he's writing. Exactly. Yeah. That uh, Frank is writing the gamble song, and <laughs> uh, yeah, just uh, as a DM, you just gotta you just gotta know when to see the signs, you know, that, that this isn't going well, and you know, just be prepared to either kill them or help them. <laughs> so uh, either way, but a DM shouldn't, you know, always be out to get his players either. So. You know, but shit happens. I mean, exhaustion, death, and Kyle's doing the final countdown. So Kyle can go he screw. Say, Shut up, David, on the last page. I know that's long, <laughs> so he can go screw. Okay, so uh, Scott, I would of course like you to have the last word, except for me. So go ahead. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> So, so so just real quick in order to be brief is that we've talked a lot about how much the responsibility is on the uh, uh, DM side and and that's true a lot of it is and we've all run into killer DMs and those aren't any fun and we've all run into to uh, DMs that aren't going to kill their players no matter what um, but I want to kind of turn that on its head and remember that players also have a responsibility to see when their DM is struggling and when their DM is struggling then players have a choice. Players have a choice to to try to to do something on their own, to be creative, to to prompt the DM to maybe if they have more experience in the DM as a player than the DM has as a DM, then then D, then players also have a responsibility to recognize when their DM is struggling and to try to creatively work with DM to get the party out of it. I'm not saying they need to be a mini DM or to, or to try to take that role, but just be cognizant whenever your DM is struggling. That's all, just be cognizant, uh, be, be aware. Um, you know, we're all about raising awareness. No, sorry, I, 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 hate, to, I hate to talk about that, that's a, that's a trope. Um, but, but in all seriousness, um, it's a collective storytelling exercise. So um, players have a responsibility to see when their DM is struggling. And, um, and sometimes, sometimes, the players need to, sometimes the players need to bail out the DM too. True. True. It's, you can have a bad night. Yeah. Uh, my final thought is, is this. Uh, most bad situations, you can find it, even with enough creative thinking, you can you can absolutely find a way out. Um, and it said it requires GM flexibility as well as creative thinking on the PCs. And to illustrate this little short story, I had a GM once, well, I didn't, I didn't play in the game, but I knew all about it. It was basically, he took uh, Aserac the Lich from the, oh, Franco, oh. he's saying, now he's bitching that we're going to. Shut with your short story, Carol. So anyways, Basically, to illustrate my point, I'm going to tell you a little story. <laughs> from the two horrors, and he decided to make it into a, a unwinnable fight. And he basically said, I'm, I'm going to kill all the players. Well, I remember I popped by this game. Uh, at the, It was at a convention, so it was only a four-hour slot. And I popped by there at the end and saw what happened again. He already killed off, I think, all but two of the PCs. And I mean, it was so it was real close, and the other ones were on life support basically. When um, they looked through their stuff and came up with the idea, and that Asterisk, if everybody was a demi lich, so he's just a skull. So, what do the players do, or the two remaining players do? They pulled out a bag of holding and put him in it. And they, it, basically, the GM had to make a roll. He rolled like a nat 20, put the thing in it, and the fight, the PCs won. So, you, with enough creative thinking, you can absolutely get out of a lot of tough situations or what you may even think are unwinnable. Uh, so with that, uh, as my final thought, ha, well, Noctia wasn't as badass as, as Aserac. I'm so. getting distracted, Carol, end the show! He keeps freaking typing shit. Don't listen to him! Hey, 
So I said, um, <laughs> here we go, I'll do that, then I won't read it. So as they say, false in Twitch, false in Twitter, uh, you know, take a look at our YouTube archive, uh, of course, by our, by our nifty gear, uh, and, you know, visit us on Discord. Uh, we may be putting some stuff. I would love to see like that letter that you wrote end up on there and maybe set up. Maybe I'll throw the questions up because I have them all, including mine, which no one else got. <laughs> uh, if you want a seat at this table, uh, the, both uh, I think both the games this week are already full. We have a whole slot of new players for Saturday, which is exciting. Uh, and the cacophony will be the usual three will be Daphne, uh, well, Caitlin, David, and Carrie uh, finishing up your plot arc for Cacophony. So there's no seats at the games this week, but, you know, keep checking in. Uh, I think they're going to be starting a new plot arc for Cacophony, so there might be a chance the seat will open up there. Um, if I think there's anything else. Of course, if you want a seat at this one to join in our discussions, you're more than welcome. Just contact, uh, contact our fearless leader at M. Hobo Inc. at gmail.com or DM him on Twitter, which is, of course is M Hobo Inc. Uh, uh, at M Hobo Inc. Uh, so I want to thank you guys. You were great. This was a great discussion and um, have a great night. I uh, hope everyone tune into the games this week. Uh, they're going to be tons of fun and I can't wait. So without further ado, everybody, wait! Got the 